Okay. It's a lot of to do about nothing, guys. <laughs> Alrighty, welcome to AZ 2006-3. Uh, I am Colonel Peoples. I'm the uh, SASE here at this Air Force Junior ROTC. We're lucky during our unit evaluation to have the Deputy Director from Headquarters Air Force Junior ROTC, uh, Mr. Greg Wynn. He's here to give us a hometown hero talk about his experiences and some of the uh, perspectives from Junior ROTC at a headquarter level. Everybody please welcome Mr. Wynn. <laughs> Well, first and foremost, let me tell you, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm uh, usually behind a desk sitting in Montgomery, Alabama at Maxwell Air Force Base where our headquarters is. And so anytime that I can get into the field and I can spend some time at a unit or with the cadets, that's great. Okay, it's like when you guys get to go on a field trip and uh, get out of class for a few days, well, this is an opportunity for me to get out of my office and... Uh, get to do a little field trip. Uh, what really makes it better for me or more exciting for me is the fact that I get to spend time with you guys. Uh, I get to spend time seeing how the instructors work and deal and, and handle their issues and their concerns, but more importantly, I get to spend time with the cadets. And that really helps justify the hard work that I put in. I go back with my batteries charged. I'm excited again about doing what I'm doing. And it, it really is a, a great experience for me. And, and being in Prescott, holy cow, what a beautiful place you guys got. Your parents chose well. It looks like it's a nice place to live. Is it? Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, sir. Good, good. I'm glad to hear it. Cold this morning. I was standing out at the flagpole uh, just after 7, and it was 27 degrees. It's a little bit different than Montgomery, Alabama, but I'll tell you what, uh, it certainly is a pleasure to be here and it's been a great day so far. All right, so a, uh, I, I guess a hometown uh, videotaping like this is to give me an opportunity to tell you a little bit about maybe what I did in my Air Force career or what I'm doing now as the Deputy Director for Air Force Junior ROTC. Uh, I'll try to give you an idea a little bit of both, but. I'm going to start with the deputy director. Everybody knows what a uh, what a parade looks like. Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay, you got horses, you got different animals and stuff. I'm the guy at the end of the parade with the broom. Okay, I'm cleaning up after the parade. I'm cleaning up the horses, and that's my job as the deputy director. Now, you're you're probably sitting there going, "What does he mean by that?" Well, all right, as the deputy, you're supposed to help make the program run smoothly, you're supposed to clean up all of the little messes and you're supposed to make sure everything works as it should work. And so that's kind of like the guy at the back. He's cleaning up everybody's mess, making sure that when we're done and they're finished, streets look good, everybody's back in the right place and everybody's doing their job. And that's what I do, okay? I've been uh, in the program for 10 years. I retired from the Air Force in 2004 after 28 years. And so I've served for the last 38 years in the Air Force War and Civil Service, at least working with the Air Force Junior ROTC program. Um, you might ask me what, what job did I enjoy the most, and I've got to be honest with you, I enjoy what I'm doing right now the most. Uh, getting an opportunity to work with some great retired officers and NCOs, uh, both Colonel DeKemper and Colonel uh, peoples are just truly outstanding individuals. Uh, you guys couldn't be any luckier than having uh, the two of them as your cadre here. Uh, they're doing an outstanding job. Uh, the opportunity to meet the kids, talk to the cadets, something else that I truly enjoy. Uh, let me just start from the beginning, from, uh, from my Air Force career. My father was in the Air Force. Uh, he served 31 years. Okay. And so I grew up moving around and, and everything else. I, uh, I moved every two years growing up. I've lived in Japan. We lived in uh, Japan for four years, actually in two different places. So we moved every two years in Japan even. And I've lived in Greece. So uh, as a kid grown up, not leaving the house yet, I've lived both in the Pacific and both in Europe. And it was a great way to grow up, a uh, great way to, to make, learn how to make friends fast, learn how to say uh, farewell and uh, stay in touch. And I've still got kids that uh, I went to school with that I'm still friends with and we still stay in touch over the years. 
But growing up in a military family, it made it pretty easy for me to figure out what I wanted to do in life. Uh, I always had the goal of wanting to fly. I always wanted to be a pilot. I wanted to be in the Air Force and fly jets. And so when I went through school, I was pretty much single-minded. I knew what I needed to do. Uh, about 17 years old, my eyes changed, and I was no longer going to be able to be a pilot, but I still was able to be a navigator. And I figured if I was going to be uh, a person that could tell pilots where to go, I would do that. And that, that, was my, uh, that was my new goal. And so when I finished high school, uh, I lived in Greece for a year, took a, took a year off and traveled around Europe and had a great time. And then when it was time to go to college, I went back to school at Washington State University. I graduated from high school in Tacoma when my father was stationed at McCord Air Force Base. But I went back to uh, college, uh, wanted to graduate with my peers, and so I finished school in three and a half years um, and got to graduate with the, the kids that I went to high school with, which was fun. But I spent the entire time focusing on pretty much one thing. Uh, I wanted a commission, so I stayed in, Ju in ROTC reserve officer training corps in college uh, and that's pretty much what I majored in. I did whatever I could do to be a good cadet. I uh, was active on the cadet staff, cadet leadership uh, and was very very uh, fortunate to have great support from the staff and the faculty there. Um, the fact that uh, I knew what I wanted to do was supported by the Air Force and they allowed me to be a navigator uh, when I graduated from the Air Force, or when I graduated from college. And so I, I was on my way to becoming a navigator uh, at, Ma at Mather Air Force Base, where I went to school at Mather. Um, the Mather process was nine months long to learn to be a navigator. Uh, I always wanted to be a, a, a fighter pilot, so I figured I would fly in an F-4 that had a navigator in the back seat, and that was my, uh, that was my dream and my goal. Uh, I had a class of 24 other people, and in that class of 24, 19 other people wanted to be uh, fighter pilots in the backseater, wanted to be a navigator and a fighter pilot, and we already knew there was only going to be 10 or 12 fighters come down for our assignment. So I had less than a 50-50 chance, but they had a thing that was called Electronic Warfare Officer School, which was kind of neat. It was a navigator required. You had to be a navigator first, but then the Air Force would send you to school for another six months, and you'd specialize in an electronic warfare, electronic countermeasures. Uh, you would be the person that would help defend uh, the airplanes against either air-to-air -air missiles from other fighters coming in, or people that would be trying to shoot you from the ground, either in surface-to-air missiles or anti-aircraft artillery, all of it radar guided. And if you went to that, they only took seven or eight of the, the top of the class, and those eight went to, to electronic warfare officer training. And normally, seven of the eight would get fighters. Now, my mom didn't raise no dummies, and so I figured I got a 50-50 chance if I stay as a navigator, uh, or if I go to become an electronic warfare officer, I'll have a 90% chance of getting to go fly a fighter, and I'll have the extra training, and th that'll be very good. Okay, my last, uh, my class of electronic warfare officers was the last electronic warfare officer of class of the year. And they had one fighter left. <laughs> Everybody else in the class got to go to be bombers, B-52s. And so while I thought my, my, my life ambition had ended, uh, it probably worked out better for me because I was very lucky to get to go into the B-52 at a time when uh, it was at a crossroads of what it was doing, how it was being used by the Air Force, and, uh, and the fact that being in a B-52 and being pretty good, pretty motivated, pretty sharp, uh, it, it helped me excel. and It helped me be uh, identified as someone the Air Force would be interested in in helping along the way. So I, I went into a B-50. Picture, picture here of a B-52, so you can see it. All go. right, there's a B-52. And all of that stuff in the front <coughs> is the ordnance. Ordnance being weapons, bombs, missiles, rockets, that a B-52 can carry. 
Now, B-52 can carry weapons either on the outside or it has a very long internal bay where they can pound, stack in bombs. Uh, a B-52 configured for 500-pound bombs can carry roughly 120 500-pound bombs. You should have think about that. 120 500-pound bombs. 500-pound bombs are a pretty good-sized bomb. So if, if you take and load that with all 500-pound bombs, it makes a very, very long, long trail of holes in the ground if, uh, if you drop them all. And that's, that's how the weapon was used in Vietnam uh, during arc light and uh, the other uh, uh, bombing campaigns over Hanoi that there was is they would start a long trail of bombs and a whole group, a mass of B-52s would just literally level everything that it flew over. Um, very, very destructive. Uh, a lot of, lot of people who have come out and, and talked about the B-52 attacks that were on the ground said it was the most terrifying experience that they have ever had in their life because it just seems like it's, it just won't stop. Just boom, 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 boom. And so it's, uh, it was very instrumental in helping bring the Vietnam War to an end. Okay, so very good airframe. Uh, interesting thing on a side note about the B-52 is that it was actually designed in the late 1940s. Uh, it received the first model of the B-52 in 1952, which is uh, pretty interesting because they produced a whole variety of different versions of the airplane from the A model, which was the earliest, until 1962 when the Air Force got its last B-52 and that was the H model. And the H model right now is still flying in the Air Force. So you figure it out from 52 to 62 to 90, or 2014, the youngest Air Force B-52 we have now was born was in 62. So that's 38 years plus 13, that's 51 years. If you have a pilot that started flying the B-52 back in 62, his or her grandson or granddaughter could be flying the same airplane that he flew in way back when. That's how long the airplane's been around, okay? Which is pretty cool. And it's gonna be around for probably another 15, 20 years. Uh, the plane was built by Boeing and, and Boeing builds them, builds them pretty good. Uh, it's gonna be a, a great, inventory or a great weapon system for this country for quite a few years. Good investment, great payback for the nation. So I did that uh, for four years. The first assignment was to Ellsworth or to uh, Fairchild Air Force Base. Uh, spent four years at Fairchild, was very fortunate uh, in earning distinction there in uh, a few competitions. Got to compete uh, Air Force-wide for being an electronic warfare officer. And uh, the year before I left, we actually won the Electronic Countermeasures Trophy. And I was uh, pretty well recognized and very lucky in that regard. Um, there's not a lot of luck that goes into a lot of things. Sometimes you're lucky, but it's probably the, the person that's good enough to be on a team that practices and puts time and effort into becoming good that uh, you kind of make your own luck. Sir, if you don't mind, I'm going to show you on Google where uh, Elmendorf is. I was at Fairchild. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, Fairchild. In Spokane, Washington. Okay, my bad. No worries. Uh, Fairchild, it's a whole different world there. Well, while he's talking at Fairchild, one of the interesting things that uh, we did, and one of the things that Colonel Peoples talked to you about is nuclear. And we did set nuclear alert. Uh, when, there has, when we were at a Cold War with the Soviet Union and China, we used to have crews on alert uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 24-7. And what this meant was is that there would be, as at Fairchild, we had four bombers that set nuclear alert and 10 tank, tankers that were also on alert. Now, what, what is alert? Alert is where you take a crew and marry it with an airplane that is loaded for war. It's got the maximum amount of gas that it can take, and internally it would have nuclear weapons. Okay, in our case we always carried 10. Okay, 
We had 10 nuclear weapons. We had eight missiles on a rotary and four big nuclear weapons that were free fall weapons. And what we would do is uh, every three and a half weeks, we would go live in a shelter. Okay, it was partially underground. It was parked right near the airplanes. And maybe some of you have seen the old movies that you'll see, uh, you'll hear a, a, an alarm go off and the crew members will all jump up from watching TV or eating dinner inside the alert facility. And we'd run out to the airplane. And we never knew whether this was an exercise or whether or not we were actually going to have to take off. And so it always, uh, it was always kind of fun. It was always a, got the, the heart racing. It was uh, it a lot of adrenaline. You get excited. But uh, the first people that got to the airplane would, would pull the covers off the engines that were covered up. And the next person would start the, uh, the, the generator and, and get the airframe ready to go. And from the time that the very first person showed up and started that process of removing the engine covers and that person getting into the cockpit, cockpit and the pilot and the co-pilot seat to them getting the engine started was probably two to three minutes. It, it went very quickly. And from the standpoint of then you had a crew of six in an airplane with the engines running waiting for what we called an emergency action, emergency action message. And that message was then transmitted by the National Military Command Center and MCC that would be a relay of the president's decision, because only the president could tell us to take off, a relay of the president's decision that could possibly send us to war. And so we get the engine started, we'd be sitting in the airframe, listening to the radios, waiting for a message. And that message, when it came to us, would be just a series of alphanumerics. No, no numerics, just alpha, bravo, delta, whiskey, sierra, tango. And we'd copy that entire message. Some messages were 24 characters. If it was a special of duty or a sign message, it may be longer. And we'd write all of those letters down in our checklist, and then we'd go to our book that was the decoder, okay? And we'd look to see what that message decoded to. And that message would decode to a Bravo 1, okay? And we'd go to the Bravo 1 checklist, and it says, okay, exercise engine start. Okay, and so we knew that was an exercise, and it was just to get the air crews onto the airplane, go through the motions of getting the engine started, and decoding a special emergency action message that's going to tell us what to do. Okay, so this one was a test. And some tests were just engine starts. Some tests were actually uh, taxi exercises where... You jockeyed to be the first one out of the chocks, which meant you were the first crew that had the airplane ready, and you were the first crew to decode the message, so you got to be the first one out. Uh, the good thing about being the first one out is you're the first one back, and so you got to shut the engines down and go back to eating your dinner or watching TV. So that was always incentive to be the first. But uh, some of the messages would uh, just simply to tell us to wait there for another message, and we'd wait in the airplane and then another message would come in and we'd repeat the process. But we had crews on alert throughout the United States sitting that part of the nuclear triad. Anybody know what the triad was? What the nuclear triad was? This country for years in the Cold War relied on a massive response uh, scenario that we would use as a detour to deter uh, aggression against the United States. And, and we had what we thought was the best combination of deterrence. We had nuclear weapons and missiles on submarines that were very difficult for anybody to find all over the oceans of the world that uh, posed a significant threat to the Soviet Union at that time. And we had missiles in silos in both Titan and Minuteman. Okay, so there was missiles here in the U.S. that, that could be launched fairly quickly. And then we had the airborne. 
And so those three vehicles or delivery systems, the submarine, the missiles, and the airframe, constituted our nuclear defense. And that's what our defense for deterring nuclear war was built upon. And we had that for, oh gracious, dozens of years. And in about 1989, maybe <coughs> 1990, uh, President Reagan, I believe, signed an executive order that took all of our weapon systems off alert. We still have them. We still have the missiles and we still have the bomber capability, but we no longer have air crews sitting in nuclear alert. We've got crew members manning our silos and we still have our nuclear submarines, but they're our safety system in, in regards to that is now our deterrence capability. And this was all part of treaty organization assault in an effort to pull some of the pressure and the tension out of the use of nuclear weapons as the friction between the United States and the Soviet Union ebbed and flowed over the years. Sometimes there would be a thawing of the tensions and we would have exchanges with them and then unfortunately something else would happen and the Soviet Union and the United States would start bumping heads a little bit more and, and people would become a little bit more concerned <coughs> about the potential of nuclear war. So in the late 80s, that's when we all came off alert and that's when uh, the United States has adopted a more relaxed policy and uh, certainly we've reduced the number of our nuclear warheads now to, uh, to truly be a, a deterrent of force and not a deterrence on display. Okay, And that's where I spent truly the, the first four years or five years of my career. Uh, a lot of it was on alert. Uh, I had an opportunity then uh, by choice of volunteering and uh, getting an opportunity to go to Maxwell Air Force Base to Squadron Officer School and to become an instructor. <coughs> and Squadron Officer School is the first professional military education step for officers in the Air Force. There's three schools that the Air Force sends officers to. The first is squadron officer school, and those are for captains who are ready to transition to staff positions as majors down the road. And then there's the intermediate service school, which is uh, Air Command and Staff College. That's a year-long program that helps prepare majors to pull on responsibilities of lieutenant colonels and squadron commanders. And finally, there's Air War College, which is the third professional military education school for the Air Force. Um, officer's career is very lucky if he gets to attend one or two of those. Uh, it's very, uh, not very often other than the senior leadership ranks that a person gets to attend all three. Uh, the Air Force puts a lot of trust and faith in uh, having those schools for uh, continuing education to help prepare senior leaders to take on increased roles of responsibility. So getting an opportunity as a captain to get to go teach captains, my peers, how to be better writers, how to be better speakers, was a great opportunity for me. And I, I really enjoyed my time at SOS. Uh, after SOS, I was very fortunate in that uh, after four years there, I was uh, selected to go to the B-1. And uh, I went to the B-1 as part of the initial cadre. Initial cadre is the, the B-1 was a jet that was designed uh, in the uh, 70s, okay, late 60s, early 70s, that was a supersonic Mach 2, low altitude, very fast uh, nuclear weapons carrying aircraft that was going to be the next generation to replace the B-52. Uh, Jimmy Carter, as president in the 1977, time frame was looking at budget concerns and canceled the program. Uh, when President Reagan was elected uh, back in again the mid-70s to late 70s, he resurrected the program and the B-1 was put back into the uh, active duty force and started flying again after it was delivered. Excuse me. <coughs> it was uh, delivered to the Air Force and around 86, 87. Beautiful airplane. 
absolutely gorgeous, extremely capable. Uh, it still had the ability to fly at uh, Mach 1.25, which is right around uh, 900 miles an hour. Uh, extremely fast. You could uh, take the aircraft extremely low to avoid radar detection. Um, just significantly different than the B-52 that it was designed to uh, augment. So that was a lot of fun because uh, I went to Dias to learn how to fly it and then uh, was able to go up to Ellsworth Air Force Base, which is in South Dakota, right by Rapid City. Uh, that was a lot of fun. And I was on the, uh, the crew to be the first crew to actually sit nuclear alert. Uh, so I was back in doing the same thing I did in the B-52 five years ago. I was still going for a week's time to go live in a underground shelter and uh, eat with a bunch of my friends and didn't get to see my wife or my family, but uh, I knew what I was doing was extremely important. Uh, my career after flying in the uh, B-1, uh, I was very fortunate to go into staff positions uh, after getting an opportunity to go to the Intermediate Service School. Uh, remember I told you it was the second tier. Uh, I had gone to SOS as a captain, as a student, did well enough while I was there for them to ask me to come back. And that's how I got back to SOS. So I went to SOS and then I got notification of selection for Intermediate Service School. Uh, but I got to go to school with the Marines. Uh, I didn't go to the Air Force. Air Command and Staff College. I actually got to go with the Marines for nine months uh, to their uh, Marine and General Staff College, and that was in Quantico, Virginia, which was a lot of fun. Uh, it it great, gave me great appreciation for what the United States Marine Corps does for this country. Uh, it is truly a very elite group of men and women who dedicate themselves to that service. Uh, Semper Fi, always faithful, is something that you've heard every Marine say, but there is no such thing as a former Marine. Uh, every Marine considers themselves a Marine, whether on active duty or retired. It's a, a great fraternity to belong to, and again, after nine months with them, I, I really learned a great deal of appreciation for what they do. Uh, after school, I was uh, selected to go to the Pentagon where I worked on the air staff for uh, two years. Uh, while on the air staff, I had the opportunity to move from the air staff to the joint staff, which meant that I was now working at the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff level on a group that truly is composed of all of the other services, uh, the Army, the Navy, the Marines, and the Air Force all come together to form a joint staff that helps the Commander-in-Chief, which is, of course, the President, and then the Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, which is the number one advisor, military advisor to the President. We built all of the, the big staff packages and, and war plans for the other services uh, while we were there. Um, while I was there, I had a chance to work for Chairman uh, of the Joint Staff, Colin Powell. Uh, many of you have heard of him and may remember him. Uh, Colin Powell was probably, to this day, I remember him as probably the most impressive uh, general officer I have ever met. The, this man was truly a patriot, a, a, an American a beyond reproach. Uh, he later became uh, involved in, with the president as the National Security Advisor for the President of the United States. He has had a number of positions at, uh, of trust and counsel at the highest levels, and he is truly a, a great American. Uh, truly, it was an honor working with him. Uh, after him was General Shali Kashvili, uh, which is a great name. It just kind of rolls off the lid. Everybody say it with me. Say, Shali Kashvili. Shali Kashvili. Shali Kashvili was the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff. He was an Army four-star general that actually came from Croatia. Uh, his parents immigrated to the States. He learned Croatian first. English was the second language to him. And he rose to the highest level of military generals in the United States Army and eventually became the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. 
And because English was a second language, it was fun getting a chance to work with him and talk with him because he spoke with a very thick accent, very thick accent. And one of the jobs I had was I was the, uh, during, during a uh, emergency operation, I was the head operations officer for the crisis action team. And every morning we'd have to brief General Shali Kashvili. And every morning, because I was the ops officer, he'd have to walk right by me. He'd come up to me every morning and goes, good morning, Greg, how are you? And he would punch me in the shoulder. <laughs> he didn't realize, I guess, that I wasn't in the Army. Because I guess that's the way the Army guys treat each other. But for an Air Force guy to be rolled over in his chair, I used to try to avoid him or I'd, I'd change shoulders just to change it up. But that was a lot of fun. He was a, a great general officer. And that was just one of the unique experiences that I had uh, growing up in the Air Force and, and, and learning my trade. We have about uh, 10 minutes left. How much? 10. 10 minutes? Holy cow. Um, I must be boring you guys to death. I'm sorry. At any rate, I have been very, very lucky in my career. Uh, after getting the opportunity to serve on the Joint Staff, I was selected to go to uh, Air War College, which means that I completed the trifecta. I attended Squadron Officer School and Residence, the Marine Corps, Air Command and Staff College and Residence, and then, then was selected to go to Air War College. Uh, Air War Colleges is for lieutenants, colonels, and full colonels that uh, are going to be going on to hopefully uh, command and leadership positions. Uh, after Air Force, uh, after Air War College, I went to my first command as a student squadron commander at Squadron Officer School, which is a great opportunity uh, because of uh, rotations of the senior leadership. Uh, I worked from squadron commander to director of operations where I had all eight squadrons working for me and then to the director of curriculum, uh, which was a great opportunity when we stood up the uh, Air Warfare and Basics School, which is a new college uh, PME that they had uh, designed for Airman Basic School for new second lieutenants. Uh, I went on after that to uh, Keesler Air Force Base where I was head of tech training for the Air Force as a uh, training uh, overseer, director of training for 2nd Air Force <coughs> for Air mm -hmm. Training Command. Finally came back to uh, the home center uh, at Maxwell where I finally retired in 2004 as the vice uh, commander of AFOTS which is now the home center. Uh, I retired on a Friday and moved my office from the headquarters position as the vice commander of a wing right into the junior ROTC office, which was about 200 feet down the road. And so I retired on a Friday and came to work on a Monday. And I've been doing junior ROTC ever since. Uh, there is not a day in my life that I regret making the decision to go into the Air Force. But, uh, it, it was truly one of the, the best things that I could have ever done. I enjoyed it, the, the family atmosphere, the friends that you've made, and everything else is truly awesome, okay? It was just a great experience that I absolutely enjoyed. But let me tell you what, I enjoy being the Deputy Director of Junior ROTC more than I enjoyed serving on active duty. While I enjoyed what I did and what I do, I did on active duty was important, I think I'm able to contribute more today for the betterment of the nation working in junior ROTC than I ever could have done active duty. And I think if you ask Colonel DeCampro or Colonel Peoples, they may tell you the same thing, that while they enjoyed their active duty job, they know that what they are doing today, working with you and help preparing you for the future, is more satisfying and they get more reward out of that than what they did on active duty. Okay? Let me just talk a little bit about what we do in Junior ROTC. Uh, can anybody guess how many Junior ROTC units we have? Just give me a guess, anybody. Okay, you guys aren't guessers, that's okay, I'll tell you. There's 863 Junior ROTC units. 863 spread around the world. There is 122,000 junior ROTC cadets, just like you guys. The difference is, is we've got programs around the world where I think it's fun to say the sun never sets on junior ROTC. 
We have programs in Europe, in Belgium, the Netherlands, England, Germany, and Italy. We've got programs in the Pacific, in Japan, Guam, and Korea. And we have programs in Puerto Rico. Somewhere, every hour of every day, the sun is over a junior ROTC unit. So the sun never sets in junior ROTC. Okay? Why is junior ROTC so important to me? It's because what we're doing and trying to give to you to help prepare you for life after high school. Anybody know what the core values of the Air Force are? We all do, sir. We all do, sir. You all do? Yes, sir. Would anybody be caring to share them with me? Ma'am? My name is Cadet Pike, and I'm a member of the Moral Infantry Fight and Integrity for Service Before Self and Excellence in all the Service. Awesome. Integrity, service, and excellence. Okay? Our motto is Building Better Citizens for America. Outstanding job, ma'am. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Building Better Citizens America. Our mission is to develop citizens of character dedicated to saving, serving their nation and community. What is character? Character is one of those things that's hard to describe. You know it when you see it. Would you say Colonel Peoples is a man of character? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I would. But let me give you three descriptors of character that I think we can relate to. Do you think Colonel Peoples <coughs> No, sir. Do you think he lies? No, sir. Cheats? No, sir. Do you think he associates with people that lie, cheat, or steal? No, no sir. All right, so you would say that Colonel Peoples has integrity. Yes, sir. You know, part, part of our cadet creed and part of our Air Force integrity is that we will not lie, cheat, or steal, nor do we associate with, with anyone who does. Whether you like it or not, if you associate with people who like, cheat, or steal, what are people going to say you do? Come on, guys. They're going to think you lie, cheat, or steal. Okay? So that's integrity, and that's part of that part of being a person of character. You think a person of character is going to try to do their best every day? Okay? Anybody grow up or get up in the morning and look themselves in the mirror and go, you know, I think I'm going to be truly mediocre today. You think people do that? No, sir. No. You should get up every morning and go, okay, what do I got today? I've got to organize. All right, I've got to do this. I'm going to do the very best that I can today. And if I get to school and when I get to school, I'm going to do my best in math. I'm going to do my best in history. I'm just going to try real hard today to do my very best. That's what a person with character does. You think a person with character is selfless, is willing to help people who need it, does volunteer work maybe in the community, uh, is willing to put others' needs above themselves? That's the, service, that's the service before self. That's another indicator uh, description for character. So in, in the whole character concept of what my mission is, what his mission is, what Colonel DeCamper's position, mission is in the back, is help develop you into citizens of character. We want you to learn and adopt the Air Force Corps values as a way for you to develop that character when you leave school. We want you to be someone who is trustworthy someone who can count on you to tell the truth, to be honest, to always put others above yourself, and to do your very best. Okay? So we have two minutes. Two minutes? All right. I'm just going to wrap it up by, uh, by, by saying this. People have a choice in life to be one of two things, either leaders or followers. Now, you don't have to respond, but I just want to... How many of you want to be leaders? All right. I hope, and for, for purposes of this video, I want you to note that every person in this room raised their hand. Those that were thinking maybe of not raising their hand, if you're not a leader, you're a what? You're a follower. You want to be known as a follower your whole life? 
No, sir. No, I don't think so. So I'm going to applaud all of you for making the decision to be in junior ROTC. Okay? This is a great first step in your high school experience, a great first step in helping prepare you for life after high school. You're going to have a lot of leadership opportunities thrust upon you. You're going to look for hopefully ways to learn to be a better leader, to accept responsibility, okay? To be Sophie in the back, okay? Your cadet squadron, your cadet corps commander. She is outstanding. Each and every one of you have the same potential to be an outstanding leader. Please take it in. Thank you very much. Great things. Dismissed. Go, Go. 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 Go.